thank you to everybody joining us today on this Monday afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Keisinger. She's going to be conducting our webinar today. And as a reminder, uh, we are recording, so it will be available uh, for future reference uh, so you could share with your teams or go back and revisit it. Um, so to that, I'm gonna say, Christine, take it away. Okay, thank you, Gretchen. Hi, I'm Dr. Christine Keisinger, and I serve as Vice President of Development and our Lead Facilitator of Conscious Communication and Emotional Intelligence at Studio B. Um, I'm really excited to be here because I heard that you will be going forward into your workplace within the next two weeks or so. So you might wonder why is she using that language going forward? That's really the essence of today's webinar. I'm gonna stop periodically um, and, and see if there's any questions and, and maybe to ask for some feedback. That said, if there's anything that I'm saying that um, arouses a question in you, please feel free to type that into the chat and I'm gonna ask Gretchen to kind of keep track of that. Is that okay, Gretchen? Yeah, and I'll periodically ask her if, if, uh, if there's anything there. But again, very happy to be here. And I would like to begin today's webinar. I wanna get my slides up here. With this image, are we really going back to work or are we moving forward? And why is this distinction important? I was with my sister who was a small business owner of a salon almost 30 years ago when she opened her doors. And a lot of time has transpired and I was with her on the day that she had to close her doors in late March indefinitely. She was not sure when she would be able to open those doors again. And I don't know that I will ever forget either of those experiences. I won't forget how it felt for her to open the doors in the first place. And I'll never forget how it felt for her to close those doors. In mid-May, she and I met again at the salon and we were just doing some cleaning up. And she was expressing to me a lot of the anxieties that her team was having about going back to work wondering what was it going to look like? What was it going to feel like? Are we going back to the same place? Will my job be different? Will the routine be the same? Will I even have a job? There were all kinds of anxieties. In other words, there was a lot of anxiety about closing the doors and there was a lot of anxiety about reopening the salon. And I said to her, the way that you're talking about this going back to work is really, really draining and depleting your energy because it's fraught with a lot of anxiety and fear. I want to take a moment and invite you to reframe this experience. In other words, is there a way that we can see the transition differently? Is there a way that we can talk about it differently? Is there a way we can reframe it? So I love this image of the reframe because it really describes what it's all about. You can see that this frame, any frame, only allows us to see just part of the picture. When we reframe something or we open it up, we can see so much more. In this image, we're very limited in terms of what we can see and what we miss out on is all of the, the green vegetation here. And we miss out on the sand, the shore and the water. So oftentimes when we're really sort of stuck and we're feeling a lot of anxiety and overwhelm about something that's happening, we might wanna ask ourselves those game changing questions that really require a lot of self-awareness and mindfulness. How might I think about this differently? So I said to her, what would it mean and how would it feel if you started to talk about this notion that we're not going back, but we're moving forward and into something new, something different? Certainly it's going to have elements of the past in it, 
but it's going to be new and it's going to be different. And in addition to just a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of discomfort about that, about that reframe, there was also suddenly a lot of excitement. Suddenly my sister started looking at even the space of her salon very differently. In preparation for the moving forward, what might we do here in this space? How might we interact with our customers differently? Our routines are certainly going to change, but how might they change in ways that feel really inspiring and really empowering? And so we began to start, we began to start talking about this return, not as a return back, but as a movement forward. So as you're preparing your own transition, which may occur within the next two weeks, I invite you to start asking yourself, how am I seeing this? And is my vision, is the lens through which, the frame through which I'm viewing this global pandemic, social crisis, crisis in general, is it limiting my possibilities? So that question, how am I seeing it? And imagine that we see all experiences through certain lenses. What if we shift the lens? What if we change the channel? What if we create a larger frame or a smaller frame? What we see changes. So part of reframing in a much larger and even a more meaningful way is to ask yourself, when you think back on this time, this period of time, this, these three, four months, what story are you going to choose to carry forward? This is a really powerful question. And this was a question that was actually posed to me just a few weeks ago in a webinar that I was part of on game-changing questions and the productivity of asking interesting questions. And it's really about choice. And then the work that I was doing with my sister, that's what I was really doing, is getting her to see that you can choose your mindset about what this transition is gonna feel like. And you can choose to communicate about it in a way that feels more empowering and inspiring. And when you talk to your employees in this way, and they begin to adapt this particular, or adopt this particular mindset, it's also going to change the way that they experience their work. So what story will you choose to tell as we continue to move through and beyond this crisis? Here's an example. Imagine that it's five years from now and you're talking to a child who's maybe in his or her preteen years and they ask about the global pandemic, right? What story are you gonna tell about what it was like? What did this time ask of you? In other words, what did it invite you to do? How did it invite you to be in perhaps new ways, different ways? What did it, ins what did it inspire inside of you? And most importantly, how did this time change you? And we might ask the same thing of our work. When you think about the work that you do in your organization, what has this period of time thus far asked of you? What it has it inspired within you? And how has it changed the way that you do your work, the way that you think about your work? And have some of those changes, have they been inspiring motivating, even exciting. So that's what the notion of the reframe means. It's just sort of holding in your minds this idea that perhaps we're not going back because chances are we're not. Chances are our workplace is gonna look very different. Chances are our policies and procedures and routines are gonna be very different. Chances are we're gonna be working with clients differently. You already are. We're already in the midst of that transition. So let's start talking about it differently. I'm not going back to work 
I'm moving forward and into something new, something different. But before we can really authentically and legitimately make that shift, that reframe, it's really important that we get clear, very, very clear about the fear. And this is something that I advise leaders to do. And this is something that I advise teams to do. Let's look very, very closely at what it is that scares us in the first place. I was having a conversation about three weeks ago with my colleague who works in HR at the PepsiCo organization. And she said, Christine, our phones are ringing off the hook as our teams and employees are preparing themselves mentally and emotionally for this return. And they have all kinds of questions. And she was discussing the questions with me and they really fall under the category of what we call the SCARF model. You will see that each of these words, S-C-A-R-F, highlight the kinds of fears that so many of us have when we are in the midst of a transition. She said, some of our employees are wondering, where do I even stand in this organization? When we go back to work, will I have the same job? Will I be doing the same things? How do I fit in? Is my job even relevant anymore? In other words, how secure is my status in this organization? You might find that you're going to be asked to do things differently or maybe even take on certain roles as you continue to make your transition. That can feel very anxiety provoking when we're not quite sure where we stand. Certainty, when are we going back? What is it gonna be like? Is it gonna be the same? Is it gonna be different? Am I even going to have a job? These are some of the questions I raised already. As human beings, we thrive in certainty. And we know that the last three to four months have really, really shaken the ground of our own certainty. And many of us have felt the instability of that, which is inherently stressful. Many of us are worried about autonomy and we might not be conscious of this, but this is really important. It's really important to know that one of the things that motivates human beings in a really significant way is when you allow them independence when you free up the reins and you allow them to make decisions and you allow them to make mistakes and you allow them to take a creative lead. And I know that I work best and you likely work best when you know that your manager, supervi supervisor, leader trusts you enough to make decisions on behalf of the company, on behalf of the work, but in crisis and transition, our leaders might be a little bit reluctant to do that because their own work is highly uncertain. But it's really important that you remember that if you're kind of feeling anxious and edgy, unsatisfied, unfulfilled, aggravated, irritated, you might want to ask yourself, in what way is my autonomy being threatened right now? In what way am I really craving the kind of independence that I once had. So autonomy might be something that feels as if it's on shaky ground. So many of us are concerned about relationship. My sister-in-law went back to work last week and she said that one of the things that was really sort of startling, she knew that the workplace area was gonna be very different, that the desks were organized differently, um, that they were going to be really, really secluded from each other. But what she misses most about her workplace is the inability to go into the common kitchen area and make lunches together and then to sit together at a common table and share lunch. And so this idea of relationship, how will we stay connected to our colleagues? How is relationship connection going to be different in our new workplace situation? It's a real concern because we know how significant 
our relationships are to our work satisfaction and fulfillment. And finally, there's the fairness factor. And that's really about dignity and respect. This is another thing that I talk to leaders about. Make sure that when you're leading and managing your teams right now, that you're taking the time to really listen to, to really be present to their own individual worries and concerns. Because we are all returning to the workplace with the burdens of our own individual worries and concerns related to something that none of us have ever experienced before. And so it's really important that our leaders are attuned to the needs of their teams. And so I want you to know that you come with all of your own needs, concerns, fears, overwhelm, anxiety, and you just want to be heard. So these are the kinds of things that we're afraid of. Status, certainty, autonomy, relationship, fairness. Will I be heard? Am I being treated with dignity and respect? I want you to know that you can use this model in any situation where you're feeling really threatened or triggered or reactive or scared or overwhelmed. You can step away and you can ask yourself, you can run yourself through scarf and say, which of these five qualities right now feel, feel like they're being threatened for me? Because if any one of these things feels threatened, we're going to feel the stress response come up. If more than one is threatened, you're really going to feel the stress response come up. And think about it, a global pandemic, all five of these qualities have felt triggered in all of us globally. So if you're wondering perhaps why you haven't been feeling yourself uh, over the course of the last three to four months, it's all here on this slide. But I want you to know that these are some of the things, conscious or not, that you might be feeling nervous and anxious about as you anticipate moving forward and into your workplace. I would be remiss if I didn't also address loss. There is tremendous loss that is being experienced by so many of us, and yet many of us are not aware of it. I just want to kind of go through these categories of loss because I want to put this onto your radar. Again, it can really help you to understand why it is that you might be feeling some anxiety. So there is defined loss. Several of us have had people in our lives who have perhaps lost their life to this virus. Maybe they have lost their jobs. Maybe they have lost their roles. So a loss occurs. It's very overt. It's very obvious. We know that it's happened. It's very defined. And then there's what's called limbo loss. This is a very, very difficult type of loss. It actually has its own category, hence the word limbo loss. This is when I suspect that I might lose, but I haven't experienced it yet. I've kind of heard through the grapevine that perhaps my job might be furloughed or eliminated, but I haven't gotten the news yet. I go in for a test, a medical test, and I've got to wait a week for the results. So limbo loss is when there's the threat of loss, but you're not quite sure it's going to happen. It could go either way. Very uncomfortable place to sit in. Anticipatory loss is when, yeah, I know it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. And then there is one of the most significant losses that so many of us globally have experienced over the course of the last four months. And that is what is known as morning dreams. Morning dreams represents the experience of having firmly held vivid ideas, dreams about something that you were certain was going to happen and it's not, or it looks radically different. For example, all of the seniors in high school 
who didn't get to graduate in the way they anticipated they would in December. All of the weddings that have been canceled. Perhaps many of you have had to cancel a long awaited, dreamed about vacation. So there are these losses, that's a loss too. It's a loss of a dream you had, a vision you had, an idea you had about the way that something was going to be, and it's not. The reason that I bring this forward is any kind of loss, whether it's defined limbo, anticipatory, or mourning a dream, is stressful on the system. It drains and it depletes the system. So it's really, really important that we name, that we put out on the table all of the things that people are afraid of right now. Where do I fit in? What's going to happen? Will I have the kind of independence that I'm used to having? How are we going to stay connected? Am I going to be heard, seen, acknowledged, treated with dignity and respect? And what losses here am I grappling with? I share all of this with you because it's a lot. It's a lot. And I just want to name it. I also want to name something else. Many of us use the words change and transition interchangeably, but they're actually two different things that happen simultaneously. And this distinction was a real game changer for me, not only in the way that I think about what's happening in my own life, in my own job, but also in the way that I teach about it. Change refers to the way in which, or the shifts that are, we experience in our external circumstances. For example, anyone walking into my sister's salon on Friday when she was able to open her doors again will notice all of the external changes. The place doesn't look anything like it looked four months ago. There's all kinds of changes right down to the paint on the wall and the lighting in the ceilings. So change might be change to your routine, change in expectations, what your employer expects of you, change in your work hours, change in your work location. It's all of these external things that are different about the work that you're doing. Transition refers to the inner work, the inner work that is required of dealing with how your external circumstances have shifted. And that's what we're really talking about here. We're talking about the mental and emotional inner reorientation that so many of us are experiencing right now. And we're experiencing transition related to a way of living, a way of being, a way of working, that isn't anymore. And yet we're not quite to the other side. And in transition literatures, this is what we call being in the wilderness. We're not quite to the other side yet. We're past what was, and we're not quite at the what's new and different. We're sort of in this strange place and we are all trying to find our way. So how do we do that? How do we forge the path forward? A couple of things and then I wanna stop. First and foremost, we wanna list and name and speak what it is that we're afraid of. We wanna name and speak the kind of loss that we've been experiencing. We want to name and speak. We want to put it out on the table. This is what this time has been like for me. And we want to share it with others and we really want to support our colleagues in doing the same. Merely being with a colleague or calling a colleague or being on a Zoom call with a colleague and saying, let's put it out there. What are we most afraid of here? What have we really been struggling and grappling with? The mere naming of what I fear 
begins to diminish its power. The next thing we want to do, and this is a really, really important tip, is to focus on what is most essential. Focus on what is most essential. For example, and I like, I want to read some sentences to you, some questions, and I want you to think about this. And you can apply this right now in the work that you're doing, and you can apply this as you move forward into your workplace. What is the very best expenditure of my energy right now? Because all those fears I laid out and all of that loss I laid out is naturally depleting to the system. And so if you've been feeling exhausted over the course of the last three or four months, it makes complete sense. So what is the best expenditure of my energy right now? What is most vitally important for me to think about communicate about, take action about, what is the most vitally important thing that right now I need to decide? And this is a tip that's really helpful for teams, employees, and for leaders. It helps to keep you focused and it helps you to move out of that stress response. Remembering that when you wake up in the morning, you only have so much energy. Think about it as sort of the bars on your phone that indicate you know, your, um, how much battery life you have. Think about it in that way. You only get so many bars of energy per day. We want to use them very, very wisely right now. What is the next best step I can take? And I take that step and then I correct if it's necessary. I want you to remember to lean into your mission and your purpose. Many organizations right now are having to shift their mission and purpose because the mission and purpose no longer fits the overall goals of the organization because they've had to pivot. But if your mission and purpose right now is really strong, is really, it remains steady because it should be a North Star of sorts, I want you to recommit to it. And what I did was I went to your website to take a look at the mission and purpose of your organization. And I just want to read some things to you. Nuventra, smarter drug development starts with designing your program around a solid understanding of the body's effect on your drug and your drug's effect on the body. You are the industry's go-to resource. And we will look at your program through the lens of pharmacology. You are the go-to resource to look at a situation through the lens of pharmacology. When we start with this understanding, the understanding of your drug, this will lead clients to make more informed decisions thus saving valuable time and valuable money. So there are a number of phrases in this statement that make me believe that if I were an employee, I'm doing really important work. I am an industry leader in the area of pharmacology, that you are the go-to resource, and that one of the results of the work you do is you save your clients valuable time and money. And there are more. You've got other areas of focus here. Why do I bring this up? Because when we are adrift in a sea called crisis, we look to our mission and vision statements and purpose statements as our anchor or as our North Star. And if I can recommit to my mission, if I have a really good understanding, this is the way in which, regardless of my role, that I contribute to this organization. If I can uh, really, really reconnect to that, I feel more motivated and inspired to do my work. And so if you've been disconnected from the way in which your organization presents itself, just go to your own website and do a little bit of reading and look at the importance and the significance 
and the meaning of the work that you do. So reconnecting to mission and purpose can be really helpful. And most important of all, we want to do all of this. We want to navigate this path forwarded into something new and different with a tremendous degree of compassion for ourselves and for our colleagues. And I'm going to talk about a neurological response that is known as tend and befriend in a moment. But before I do that, I just want to take a moment and I just want to check in and see if anything that I've said so far has resonated with any of you, if any of you have any thoughts, comments. Um, what has this three, four months been like? Maybe commenting on the loss or the fears or anxieties. Am I the only one? Um, feel free to unmute yourself. Don't be shy. Anyone? Okay, well, as I come back into um, Tend and Befriend, what I would love for you to do, if you would be willing, is to maybe provide some of that information in the chat. If anything resonated with you, please just chat away. Maybe just by providing a couple of words, um, some thoughts or ideas about anything I said so far that resonated. So one of the things that we know about stress, whenever we start to feel triggered, overwhelmed, anxious, is one of two things tend to happen. The first you're very familiar with, and it's called stress response. So I perceive that there's some kind of threat, something happens, it's very upsetting to me, I'm feeling some discomfort, and right away my own neurological system kicks in, and I'm ready to fight, I'm ready to run, I'm ready to freeze or shut down. And we know this to be stress response. And we tend to gravitate towards one of those three things. For example, my go-to tends to be fighting or shutting down. So that's one neurological system that might kick in when we're feeling overwhelmed. A second neurological system that might kick in is something called the pleasure reward system. Now the pleasure reward system works like this. Something happens, it gets me charged up, triggered, reactive, stressed, and I'm really uncomfortable with feeling that way. And so I want to eradicate that discomfort. I wanna do something to soothe it or to get rid of it completely. So what I do is I seek things that feel pleasurable and rewarding. A good example of that is, a very common example of that is, I'm feeling the discomfort of stress and anxiety and I head to the refrigerator and I'm looking for my favorite comfort food. And many of us have done this over the course of the last three to four months. Or I find myself mindlessly scrolling on social media and we know that the scrolling, the act of scrolling actually has a sedating impact on the brain, which is why the scrolling and the spending time on social media can be so addictive. So I've got the discomfort, the scrolling calms me down. We might find ourselves gravitating toward binge watching Netflix series. Now what I would really wanna emphasize here is that there's nothing wrong with any of that. It's a very, very common human reaction to seek pleasure and reward when we're feeling discomfort. It becomes problematic when it becomes something that's really chronic. Because what we're really seeking is we're seeking the secretion of dopamine. When I seek pleasure reward, I begin to generate within myself dopamine. And when dopamine is present, it just feels like this warm, secure blanket. It's very, very calming and soothing. But inevitably, the effects of dopamine begin to fade rather quickly 
and then I'm back to the same discomfort. And then I might find myself back into the cycle again. Discomfort, pleasure, discomfort, pleasure reward, and on and on. So in a chronic way, seeking that dopamine depletes the system, drains the system, begins to impact us negatively, physically, mentally, emotionally. And the same is true of the stress response, produces lots of cortisol and adrenaline. And that only takes us so far before that begins to drain and deplete the system. So there's this third neurological possibility. Now stress response and pleasure reward response happen pretty automatic in each of us when stress is present. But there's a way to override that. There's a way to interrupt. And the way that we can do that is by calling upon another neurological system that is affectionately known as tend and befriend. And this comes out of the work of Dr. Shelley Taylor at UC Berkeley. Tend and befriend is really linked to another way in which we as human beings are hardwired. In addition to being hardwired to survive, we are also hardwired to nurture and connect out of necessity. We need human connection to survive. So it's really, really deeply ingrained in us. But this third neurological response is something that we can actively choose. And this is how it works. Something upsetting happens, I become really charged up about it, I'm triggered, I'm about to become really reactive. And rather than going there, I take a moment, I acknowledge, okay, I'm getting really heated here, my heart's pounding, you know, I'm really, really feeling overwhelmed and reactive here. I feel like I'm gonna blow up. I notice, and rather than blowing up, I make a choice. Okay, the discomfort is here. I'm gonna to tend to it, and I'm gonna to tend to it in a friendly way. And what that means is, I am not gonna be hard on myself. I am not gonna be judgmental and critical on myself because I'm feeling this way. The example that I like to give is you're watching a child who's learning how to ride a bike for the first time. And he or she is up and down, up and down, and finally down, scraped her knee, is bleeding, is crying. I'm the parent or the caregiver, the onlooker. I see that happening. What would I do in the moment? I would rush to the child. I'd probably get down on my hands and knees. I would tend to the situation. I would tend to the child, the wound, his or her feelings in a kind and friendly way. Because it's what we do. We know how to do that as human beings. So when stress is present, rather than allowing stress response to come in, fight, flight, freeze, rather than relying on pleasure reward, what if I made a choice to tend and befriend? The hormone that's secreted, generated, when we come in to tend and befriend is called oxytocin. Oxytocin is very sedating. It's very relaxing. It's very nourishing. It's very nurturing to the system. If I choose in response to my stress to tend and befriend, I'm not depleting my system. I'm not causing harm. I can tend and befriend in a chronic way and it is not going to drain me. So we might think, oh, this is, I don't really know that I buy this. I don't really know that you know, this sounds like something that I'd like to do. Um, I was very suspicious of this work, but it really grows out of lots and lots of work right now that is emphasizing or putting an emphasis on the neurological benefits of compassion and self-compassion and the kinds of hormonal changes that occur, physiological changes that occur, 
when we choose to tend and befriend, when we choose to engage actively um, in such a way that we are changing our physiological state, which changes the way we're thinking, which can change the way that we communicate, which can change the actions that we take, which can change the way that we are seeing something and impact our capacity in any moment to reframe a situation. So I would like to guide you through a process, a guided visualization that I very simply call the tend and befriend practice. This will take about five minutes. Um, I want to do this for two reasons. I want you to experience it. And if any of you are sitting here or have arrived to this session feeling stressed, this is a very, very natural form of stress reduction. But I also want to take, it, take you through it so as you're experiencing it, you can sort of remember the steps. And if you were to practice this on your own, three to five minutes per day, you can get yourself to a point where at any moment and in any situation, even in the midst of something really upsetting occurring, or an encounter with another person, a conflict, whatever it is occurring, where you can just sort of guide yourself through in the moment and shift yourself out of stress response and into more of a responsive stance, okay? So to experience this, I want to invite you to just sit comfortably in your seat or if most of you have your cameras off, if you'd like, I want to invite you to even lay down. You can experience it in a laying down position, especially if the body is really fatigued, okay? So once you get comfortable, I also want to invite you to close your eyes. And if that's not comfortable, I just want you to keep your gaze very soft, steady, focused forward, and just maybe allow your eyes to really relax and the musculature around the eyes to relax. So wherever you're at and whatever you've decided in terms of your position, I just want you to keep your awareness on the sound of my voice. And we're just going to begin with three deep breaths. Taking a very, very deep breath in, taking in all the air your body needs to function well. And as you exhale, allow the shoulders to drop and soften. And take another deep breath in. And as you inhale, all of the air you need to nourish your system. And as you exhale, allow the jaw and the face to relax. And one more time, take a very deep breath in and as you exhale, taking in all the air you need to function at a high level and as you exhale, allow all the muscles to relax if just for the next few moments. And now dropping into any breathing pattern, any way of breathing that feels most comfortable for you right now. As we just begin to settle the system, settling down the system, allow everything to settle. And as that system is settling down, I want you to very gently bring to mind, just very gently bring to mind an image of someone or something that's been really heavy for you. Something that's been the source of overwhelm, anxiety, fear, maybe irritation. 
Just bring it to mind. And just see it, just know that it's there. And now I'd like you to bring to mind an image of one person. One person in your life that has always been or is always a source of support, source of strength for you. And I want you to imagine that they have just opened their arms up to you. And they've invited you to place in their arms that issue, that burden, that heaviness, whatever it is. You're just releasing it now into the care of that supportive person. And I wanna make sure that you've released every bit of it, all of it. And for the next few moments, I want you to just rest. Rest in the experience. Of having let that go. and rest in the experience of receiving of receiving from another person compassion Just allowing the entire system to benefit from just taking a few moments to let go of a big source of stress. Gently now returning to the breath, take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, allow the face and the jaw to relax a little bit more. Taking another deep breath in. And as you exhale, Allowing the muscles to relax just a little bit more. And one more time, deep inhalation. And exhale.
And whenever you're ready, but only when you're ready, please open your eyes. So that was tend and befriend. It's just a way of creating within yourself a little bit of a sanctuary, a little bit of a respite from whatever it is you've been carrying around. Um, the visualization, the imagining that you're sort of giving that over to someone else to hold for a little while or, or maybe permanently, you know, perhaps you're back thinking, I, I'm just letting that go, you know, for the rest of time, or perhaps you've already picked it back up again. It, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you just had that brief period of time to set it down, to give it away, to set it aside but mostly reflecting on what did it feel like to be the recipient of compassion or the energy of compassion being directed toward you. So many of us here, I'm certain, um, probably have a wellspring, endless amounts of compassion that we're giving out, you know, a tremendous capacity to nurture and care for others. But when we are invited to be the receiver of that, um, it can often be difficult. But going back to the neurology of it all, we really want to create opportunities to not get so swept up in stress response as our option or pleasure reward response as our option, but to be more intentional about what we're going to do the next time we are in a situation where we're meeting up with stress and overwhelm. So in my own life, which again, I'm, I'm the same boat, which has been, you know, incredibly stressful over the course of the last three to four months. This has been my go to because I know its benefits firsthand. It doesn't help me to go into stress response, pleasure reward response. Um, or to be in that any of those states for three to four months. So tend and befriend, dropping into this, okay, this discomfort is here, rather than fighting against it, running from it, eating a quart of ice cream over it, freezing and shutting down over it. I'm gonna pay attention to it in a very nurturing, kind way. Um, that's a game changer. And it really puts you in a position where you feel that you can be responsive to the stress that enters your life as opposed to reactive. And feel free to share this practice with anyone. The other thing that I want you to think about is, well, how might I use this on the spot? Again, I can be anywhere out in the world and something can happen and I can feel the charge of the trigger. This real sign that I'm on the pathway towards total reactivity and I can just pause and say, okay, make a choice here. You can blow up if you want, you can fight if you want, run if you want, freeze if you want, but maybe you'd prefer to tend to this and just remember the benefits that you derive from the visualization, from the meditation. So you can do a version of what I just took you through in just a couple of minutes and you can apply it on the spot, which is one of the things that I really like about this practice. So I wanna just take an opportunity again to just check in and see if there are any questions, any comments, um, any, you feel free to unmute yourself. How did that feel for you? Um, curious about that. Okay, well, we have about five minutes. So I think what I'll do is to leave you with one other practice that's um, very much aligned with what we just did. 
And this practice, it's gonna go forward to a couple, couple of slides. This practice comes out of the work of doctors Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer. Um, they are two scientists who study, write about, and teach about the neurological impact of what they call the self-compassion practices. Their work is really interesting. It's pretty cutting edge as far as um, neuropsychology goes, um, and it's really, really effective. Again, I was a complete skeptic about the science of compassion and self-compassion until I started to participate in um, a great number of their trainings and really look at the research that they're producing regarded to compassion and self-compassion. So the self-compassion break is one of their hallmark trainings, and it's really known as a mindfulness-based micro practice, which means you can use it anywhere, anytime. And this is what I love most about it. So here's how it works. Again, you're, you're having a moment where you can feel all of those physiological sensations that indicate stress is here, there's discomfort here, you're starting to feel charged, you're starting to feel reactive and triggered. So the first thing you do upon acknowledging that you're right there is you pause and you say to yourself, whoa, this is really hard right now. The phrase that they use is, I'm suffering. I like, this is really hard right now. This sucks. I can't believe this is happening. Whatever it is, you just acknowledge that whatever it is that is happening is uncomfortable and difficult. So it starts with the acknowledgement, just as we started this presentation. Let's put on the table what the stressors are. The second step is what they call connect to common humanity. And what you do when you connect to common humanity is you say, yeah, this is really difficult. And I also know that there are people all over the planet right now that are likely feeling the same thing or something really similar, or they have felt it or they are going to feel it. Now we don't come into common humanity as a way of diminishing what we're feeling. We come into the idea of common humanity to take ourselves out of feeling alone. Because part of our suffering when it comes to stress, especially when stress is really unleashed and pretty extreme, is that we tend to hold this belief that there isn't anyone else who's feeling this way. And so connecting to common humanity is just a reminder that you're not alone in this. And then the third step, which seems very simplistic, but is actually probably the most difficult of the entire formula, is to just be kind. Do not go into negativity, self-judgment, self-evaluation, self-badgering, negative self-talk. So I'm suffering, this is really difficult. Acknowledge what's happening. Slide right into, and I know that I'm not alone in this. So just be kind. I was introduced to this protocol about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, when I was taking a training with Neff and Germer. And again, I found it to be very suspicious. Um, but I thought, I'm sort of interested, I'm sort of intrigued by it, I'm going to do this for one month. Whenever anything arises and I'm feeling even a tiny bit triggered, whether it's really tiny or really big, I'm going to take myself through these three steps. And by the end of the month, I could not believe the impact that these three steps had on my life. And that by applying these three steps, each time something occurred that triggered me, this break has just become a very, very natural way of being. It's just the first thing I go to whenever I'm feeling really triggered. The acknowledgement, that's everything. Having the awareness, that's mindfulness in a nutshell. I'm suffering here. I'm not alone. I'm just gonna give myself a break. I'm just gonna be really kind about it. So if I could leave you with anything related to how it is that we go forward, 
I want to just remind you to name it. Name whatever it is that feels hard for you, that feels stressful. Acknowledge those losses, contemplate those losses, and know that all of that stuff is really draining and depleting to your system. Begin to play with ways that you might reframe this transition that you're in. Transition is the inner work. The change is occurring all around us, but the transition is the way that on the inside you're reorienting yourself. And that's work. That's deep emotional, psychological work. And you're in the middle of it. And think about what story am I gonna carry forward? How might I move forward in a way that feels really empowering and inspiring? So don't hesitate to refrain and do this all in the context of lots and lots of compassion and self-compassion, choosing, choosing that third neurological response to stress, tend and befriend. Thanks for coming today. I know I went over a minute. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate it. That was great. Thank, Thank you for being here. Yes, and we will make sure we get a recording over to you as awesome. well as a link to our website. Um, our blog has a lot of additional information and practices that people can access for free. So I'll be uh, following up with you, Andrea, to get you that information, okay? Sounds awesome. Thank you, ladies, again. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.